It says a student releases the block of mass M from rest at the top of the slide, H1. The block moves down the slide and off the end of the table, height H2, landing on the floor, a horizontal distance D from the edge of the table. Friction and air resistance are negligible. The overall height is H. And a setup is determined by the height of the room. Therefore, H1 is increased. H2 must decrease. Okay, so that's an important thing that H is a constant. But H1 plus H2 equals H. So when one changes, the other one automatically changes. You have to keep that in mind. Um, therefore... It says the student wants to adjust H1 and H2 to make D as large as possible. Without using equations, explain why making H1 very small would cause D to be small, even though H2 would be large. And then without using equations, explain why H2, um, making that very small, would cause D to be small, even though H1 would be large. So the whole conversation here is more of what I expect for the exam. So the explanation part is the the heavy part of this. The like I said, the write the equation part probably less going to be less um, uh, less huge, but um, them having you recognize something is probably going to be pretty pretty big deal. So let's see how they got. It. So first, for your answer to H one, you're going to have to indicate that if H one is small, then the box won't acquire very much horizontal velocity. Because if H1 is small, the amount of potential energy it has relative to the top of the table surface will be small. And therefore, it won't have very much kinetic energy when it makes it here, which suggests that its horizontal velocity will not be very big when it makes it to the edge of the table. And even though H2 is large, if it's not moving sideways very fast, it won't land very far away from the edge of the table. So that would be the argument for A number one. And the argument for A number two will be kind of the reverse of that, in that H1 is really large, the kinetic energy the object has relative to the top of the table will be, will be huge, but it won't have very, very much time in the air to fall. And without having very much time in the air to fall, even though its horizontal velocity might be large, with its horizontal distance related to the horizontal velocity times the time, when H2 is small, well, by necessity, T is going to also be very small. So it might be traveling fast, but it's not going to be able to travel horizontally very far. So those are the two arguments that you should make for A number one and A number two. I, I would caution you that when you talk about things like potential energy here, um, make sure your conversation about potential energy points out the relevant um, height that you're going to take in for zero potential energy. So in this case, the the relevant height is the top of the table, not the floor, because we're not interested in the amount of energy it has relative to the floor. That doesn't help us. That would help us figure out maybe how fast it's going when it strikes the floor, that velocity it has at an angle there. But that's not really of interest. To figure out the horizontal distance, we need the horizontal velocity which is how fast it leaves the table at. So we, you know, just in questions like this, making sure that you point out to your test readers what you are measuring for, velo for energy is probably important. Um, question B, derive an equation for D in terms of H1, H2, M, and the physical constraints. That's probably not going to be on the exam. They're going to be more likely to say, student one has come up with this equation or found this on the internet evaluate its worthiness as an equation for describing this event. So I would keep that in mind, that that's more likely the answer, the way they're going to do it. But that doesn't mean we couldn't do this. Um, there's not a whole lot there to worry about. We need to consider that the distance is related to how long it's in the air. That's this part. And its horizontal velocity. That's this part. How long it's in the air... We've talked about this for a long time. It's going to be related to how far it has to fall, which is 2H2 over G. We've, we've talked about that since the beginning of the year. And although we could prove that by doing, you know, by, by grabbing a motion equation, we've done it enough times where I don't feel like that's necessary. And 
the horizontal velocity we would get just by indicating that the potential energy is equal to the kinetic for the surface of the table, which means mgh1 equals one half mvx squared, which actually gives us something we've used quite a bit as well, <laughs> 2gh1. So, you know, throw all that together, and we get kind of an interesting answer for D. We get the square root of 2gh1 times the square root of 2h2 over g. Interestingly enough, the uh, g's cancel here. And you get 2 times the square root of h1 times h2. So it has an interesting answer, um, which is why, you know, it's worth taking a look at. And no, I don't think you're going to be having to do this on the exam. Not like this. But I don't think this is terribly out of the question for you guys. Yes, Andrea. Oh, come on. Which one has the potential energy relative to the tabletop? It's got to be the H that's measured from the top of the table. And which one is about how long it takes to fall after it leaves the table? Well, that's got to be the H that's after the table. Well, look, H2 is how long it's going to take to go from the top of the table to the ground. That's H2. That's how long it's in the air. H1 is based on the slope, the little hill that's up there. And if you don't like that answer, I, I'm, I'm willing to be a little more patient, but probably not a lot. You know, you have to envision the fact that it acquires this velocity but from sliding down the ramp. Yes or no? Okay, well, how high is it above the table on the ramp? That's not H2. That's H1. And then it has this horizontal velocity when it's flying through the air. The one that deals with projectiles. The knowledge that Vx remains constant all the way till it reaches the ground. Its horizontal velocity is a constant because gravity can only increase its vertical velocity. So the fact that it travels a distance d along the ground as it falls to the ground is based on how long it's in the air. Well, which of the two h's measures the, the time that's in the air? It's got to be the one after it leaves the table, so that's got to be h2. We good? All right. So how about you guys? We good? All right. So, C number one says, write the equation or step in your derivation of part B, not your final answer, that supports your reasoning in part A, and briefly explain your choice. And then C number two says, write the equation or step in your derivation of part B, that supports your reasoning in part A. So they want the individual steps. And so the first one, which pertains to um, H1 being small, is here. When h1 is small, you know, when h1 is small, <laughs> clearly vx is small. And over here, you know, when h2 is small, clearly t is small. But also, in our final answer here, if either one of those is small, then we know that our, uh, our value for d is small because of that product. Now it says, if the experiment is repeated on the moon, 
without changing H1 or H2, will the new landing distance be greater than, less than, or the same as the landing distance when the experiment is performed on Earth? It's the same. As long as there is some gravity, you know, because we know gravity is going to be required to pull the block down. So if there's no gravity, then there's no problem at all. I Meaning there, there's no launch of the object. There's no change in velocity. But as long as there is some g, it doesn't matter what the g is, the landing distance is the same, no matter what the gravity is. Because there's no g in the answer. So if g was smaller, its horizontal velocity would be smaller. But it would also spend more time in the air. And therefore, those two things work together to give us the same value for, for d. But you don't have to go into that. I mean, he says, explain your choice. If you have the correct derivation here, your answer would just simply be g doesn't appear in our final answer for the location of d. Because it doesn't appear in our final answer for the location of d, it would not contribute to the answer, regardless of the value of g. Or if a problem like this is on the exam, the biggest difference is they're not going to have you do a derivation like this. They're going to produce an equation and have you comment about the equation itself. I don't see them having you go through this kind of process. And like I said, I, this was mostly an explanation, but part B did require the derivation part. And I didn't mind having you guys do that because I think your ability to do this allows you to look at an equation and determine whether it seems to make reasonable sense. There's a lot of things about this final answer that I would look at to determine whether it makes reasonable sense as well. The fact that H1 and H2 are both going to be in terms of meters, most likely. And that way, my answer is going to be meters squared, and then I take the square root and get meters. So by looking at this alone, you know, just the, the units of the answer, the square root of meter squared gives me meters, and my answer should be in meters. It's one of those little things that kind of helps promote whether the equation you are given to look at makes reasonable sense. So I would encourage you to look at the units part. They've done a pretty good job of making sure that our examples tend to match up with units correctly, even if the equation is poorly written or poorly constructed. But no, I think this one's good. I like this one. The problem goes on to say, an archer tests various arrowheads by shooting arrows at a pumpkin that is suspended from a tree branch by a rope, as shown to the right. Um, I don't know why it's saying to the right, because it's shown above, but hey. When struck head-on by the arrow, the pumpkin swings upward on the rope. All right. The maximum angle theta that the rope makes with the vertical is different for each arrowhead that the archer tests. Each arrow, including its arrowhead, has the same mass and is shot with the same velocity towards the, the maximum angle. I'm sorry, shot towards the right. All right, so before we go into that too much, m is going to be a constant. I assume m for the pumpkin is going to be a constant. And I foresee several stages of this problem. There's... The stage of the problem where the pumpkin has just been struck by the arrow. So the arrow is now embedded in the pumpkin and the pumpkin and arrow are moving to the right. Now they also go on to say there's another version of this where the arrow passes through the pumpkin Probably with some velocity that's different, but the pumpkin is still likely moving to the right. Then there's a third version of this. I'm gonna move this up a little bit, move that up a little bit, move that up a little bit. There's a third version of this where I'm running a little bit out of space, but I think you get the idea. Where the arrow bounces off some velocity this way. And the pumpkin, again, moves to the right. And in all three cases, we're probably interested in figuring out how it affects the angle that's made after the collision. Now, 
the thing to think about here before we go on is, and I, I know um, some, I think Andrea asked me a question about this and I didn't answer on Slack this morning because I had a feeling that we'd probably be working here together. But this problem is a combination of things, a combination of momentum transferred to the pumpkin and conservation of energy for the pumpkin. The collision doesn't conserve energy. Collisions seldom do. Collisions transfer momentum. And yes, that means they also transfer energy. But in all three of these cases, the arrow has a different amount of energy after the collision. And I want to be careful about the way I say this because I want you guys to hear the words correctly. In each one of these collisions, the arrow has a different amount of energy after the collision. The arrow does. Because in each one of these, the arrow is traveling with a different velocity after the collision. The arrow only ever has kinetic energy. It gives some of that kinetic energy to the pumpkin. But by doing so, it lost some energy. But it also drilled a hole in the pumpkin. That took energy. How much energy? I don't know. When it passed through, it drilled two holes in the pumpkin. And when it bounced off, it might not have drilled a hole at all. There's no way of knowing how much energy that took. And we don't have to. In any collision question, your best bet in analyzing, in analyzing the collision is to consider momentum. Momentum had to be conserved in all of those cases. Had to be. It's a collision. They interacted by Newton's third law. And therefore, whatever momentum the arrow had before the collision, the system had to have after the collision. So I'm not worried about the theta yet. Right now, I'm just worried about the three velocities. And in looking at those three velocities, I want to figure out which one of them produced the greatest change in velocity of the pumpkin and which one produced the least change in the velocity of the pumpkin. And that's not particularly hard to figure out. In order to figure that out, all I need to ask myself is, in which case was the change in velocity of the arrow the greatest? For example, in which of these did the arrow have the greatest change in its velocity? And in which one of these did the arrow have the least change in its velocity? And it's pretty easy to see that this one is the least change in the velocity. It passed right through. It probably just slowed down a little bit. But in the bottom one, it bounced off. At the greatest change in velocity. I mean, I had to stop the arrow, turn it around, and push it back. Now, the reason why that's important is the change in velocity tells us the change in impulse of the arrow. And the change in impulse of the arrow has to be equal to the change in impulse of the pumpkin. That's conservation of momentum. So by whatever amount the momentum was changed by the, you know, for the arrow, the pumpkin had an equal change in momentum, which means that this is the maximum velocity of the pumpkin when the arrow bounced off. And this is the minimum velocity of the pumpkin. Oops, no one right there. When the arrow passed through. And this is the middle. Now, after this, the angle to which the, pu the pumpkin rises is 100% dependent on the velocity of the pumpkin. That part's conservation of energy and has nothing to do with the arrow. Whatever the velocity of the pumpkin was, one-half mv squared is going to be its kinetic energy, and it will swing upward until it reaches whatever height is associated with the amount of potential energy the pumpkin will have as it swings upwards. Now, in order to get all the, the pieces in place here, to be able to answer the question in a clear, coherent paragraph-length response that may also contain figures and or equations justify your ranking, 
I think there are three things you'd have to cover in that paragraph. First, you'd have to cover the fact that the angles are just a way of showing that the velocities are being ranked. We are ranking the angles, sure. We're doing that because you can see the angle easily and clearly. But we're just using the angle as a metaphor for the velocity. Because this angle is related to the height. And the height is related to the velocity. The larger the height, the larger the angle. And therefore, the larger the angle, the larger the velocity. So I think the first thing you need to do in your paragraph is make sure you connect the angle to the height and the height to the velocity. Now, connecting the angle to the height can be just a description. I don't think you have to do any more. I know that we've talked about the fact that you could remember that the length of this string and the height to which the pumpkin rises, they're related. The height equals L times 1 minus cosine theta. But remember, I don't think you need to do any of that. Now, although we've talked about that in class, that's geometry and, and trig. The truth is, I think most of you recognize that the height is based on the fact that the pumpkin was here. And now it's new height, you know, whatever this change in height is, from here to here, that's how much that angle is. That angle is greater, the height's going to be greater. Do, I, do we need to really run through that? I think there's enough just visually to be able to say that the angle is related to how high the pumpkin rises. And by conservation of energy, the height the pumpkin rises is related to its velocity after the collision. I think those two sentences connect the angle to the height and the height to the velocity and bring in the appropriate physics principle that's necessary in describing it. You might want to go a little bit further and say that the kinetic energy the pumpkin has after the collision will be transferred into potential energy as the pumpkin swings upwards. Making that sentence at least does more than just require the judges to know what conservation of energy is. It makes sure that you are very clearly talking about the pumpkin's energy and not the arrow's energy. And I think that's something that would be important for the, the table graders to you know get from that. And then what you're left with doing after that is your explanation for the velocities of the pumpkin after the collision. And those descriptions should come directly from indicating in which case the pumpkin had the largest um, transfer of momentum. It's a collision, so the total momentum had to be zero before... I'm sorry, the total momentum had to be equal to the momentum of the arrow before and after the collision. So whichever one changed the velocity of the arrow the most also changed the velocity of the pumpkin the most. So in your thing there, for theta ebb and theta pass and theta bounce, you know, it's if any of these two are the same, put a two, put greatest, so I'm going to say... See, one is the greatest angle, so that's one. And then passing through is the least, so embedded is in the middle, and the least is passed through. That would have to be the right answer. Conservation of momentum requires that the net impulse of the system is zero. So any change in momentum of one object, there has to be an equal and opposite change in momentum of another. That's why describing the change in momentum of the arrow is so important, because it's related directly to the change in momentum of the pumpkin. All right. Let me just frame your answer a little bit, because I'm recording this as we go, because I was going to post it later for people who are unwilling to get up this early. Um, I want to... to to make sure that you know, I get your question right, you know, is grammar, is your writing going to be critiqued? Um, nothing in our scoring guides talk about the, um, the writing being critiqued in the way you're describing it. But the fact that they use the phrase paragraph length response, clear, coherent paragraph length response, I, I get concerned when um, 
we were trying to convince somebody of our argument and con- you know, try to convey to them an idea about physics. And when they are reading your response, they might be unable to interpret what you mean because you are not providing them with articulate prose. So I would definitely be concerned about writing run-on sentences, poor grammar, and um, e- even inconsistent or, or difficult to follow prose. Because I think what it conveys then is that you have a difficulty in communicating your idea and your thoughts aren't organized. So before you, you have 15 minutes, you know, I wouldn't have drawn all of this, but what you can do on scratch paper real quick is maybe just sketch the things that you're going to have to say. Like in my head, I'd be saying to myself, okay, the angle is related to the velocity after the collision. I'd be saying that how high it goes depends on how fast it was going after the collision. I need to make that statement. And um, why, why is that true? Because conservation of energy, I should probably make that statement. These are two different sentences now. One is, you know, and, and I, would, I would make it like that. You don't have to have a paragraph that uses, you know, incredibly exceptional high-level prose. They can be, and I would encourage this, simple sentences. Simple noun, verb agreement, one idea per sentence to make your paragraph. The pumpkin swings upwards, you know, based on how fast it's going after the collision. There, that's a single sentence, period. Don't run on. Don't try and make the sentences complicated. It doesn't make you sound smarter. And you don't need that. I know your English class has tried to, you know, impress upon you this idea that your prose needs to have a certain level of vocabulary and um, using adjectives and adverbs correctly and prepositional, you know, all of that's great and stuff. We don't need any of that. The whole clear and coherent suggests simple sentences. So I would go simple and lay into that period, meaning make the sentence simple, end it, start a new sentence. It's so much better if you have five or six simple sentences, each one of them saying specifically what you want to say without one long sentence that sounds complicated and combines a bunch of things. You don't need to do that. You know, so the change in momentum of the arrow has to be equal to the change in momentum of the pumpkin, period. When the arrow has the biggest change in momentum, the pumpkin has the biggest change in momentum as well, period. Simple sentences. And then with each of those, kind of advance your argument a little bit forward. But I would... I would, I would worry about run-on sentences. I would worry about vocabulary choice. And I would worry about um, sentence structure. But not because I think they're grading you on it. But because you need to appear to be um, clear and coherent. Those are the specific words they're using. And anything that gets in the way of that gets in the way of your argument. So you can have great ideas but if, you're, if the person reading it believes you're, um, you're inarticulate or believes that you, you know, can't write or can't communicate, they might immediately just try to pick apart your argument because they don't want you to get the points. They don't like the way you write. Now, they're not supposed to do that, but I think human nature suggests that they might anyways. Does that make sense? So, you know, take a second, you know, take a deep breath. And I know for, for some of you, that whole idea is, is tough. You know, you're wasting time. You know, the clock's ticking. You see that timer. It's going to make your blood boil. Take a second. Jot down just a quick couple notes. Those, that, that opportunity to jot down a few things will just help you organize yourself a little bit. You're not going to need to write a lot of sentences here. I'm thinking five, max. Five simple sentences that connect all the dots just talked about the pumpkin problem because they could easily ask a follow-up question about the pumpkin problem that would allow them to address simple harmonic motion and not add very much time to the question but also indicate you know whether you have the information about simple harmonic motion um in the pumpkin question which we just we did just finish it but 
the question was about which one would produce the greater angle uh, for the pumpkin to swing on between the arrow that passed through, got embedded, or bounced off. And our conversation, you know, talked about change in momentum of the arrow being equal to the change in momentum of the pumpkin. So the one where it bounces off would give you the greatest angle, and the ones where it passes through would give you the least angle. Um, a nice follow-up to that would be first a reminder that the angle is related to this length. And we're able to see that because of something that we know about for geometry. And this is, I don't think this is going to be a big part of the exam, but I, I want to throw out there that, or a reminder that they're not going to be really focusing on the mathematics of it, but you're going to have to probably explain, or if, in the least amount, be able to know that when the pumpkin swings upwards, the angle that it makes is going to be related to the change in height of the pumpkin. And although they're related, how they're related probably isn't as important as the fact that they are related. And I think that's, that's all we really need to, to, to be worried about when it comes to the, the exam itself. Remember, they're less concerned about the math as they are about the physics. But, and here's where I think you need to be careful though. If they wanted to follow up with a question about simple harmonic motion, they could ask in which of these cases would the period be most affected by the path of the arrow? And that's the kind of question I think where, you know, they're testing both the, your knowledge of how this angle is related to the original velocity, the original um, collision with the arrow. But also, do you understand that the period of oscillation is controlled by specific factors related to the, the construction of your oscillator. And generally, although there's going to be a fraction here, the top of this fraction and the bottom of this fraction tend to have the controlling interest be about inertia and restoring force. For the pendulum, that's why L is at the top, because the inertia of the pendulum is related to the um, moment of inertia of a point mass, and that's why L ends up being at the top, because moment of inertia is based on that distance more than it's based on the mass of the object. The bottom, the restoring force, is the acceleration of gravity, because we know that it's gravity that causes it to oscillate. Now. Although we talked and did some derivation of, of pendulums and spring mass systems, ultimately the thing that controls their period is something that's physical about the device. So that's why in all of the things we've seen, we have that 2 pi out front because there is the sine or cosine function associated with it. But we get these pieces of it that are going to be related to, again, inertia and restoring force. But they're physical factors. There's something about the construction of the device. So it's the choice of which spring to use and how much mass to hang. Those things are important decisions, but the overarching idea here is that the period of oscillation is not related to the energy of the system or the amplitude of the system. And I'm saying the same thing when I say that meaning energy and amplitude are both the same measurement when it comes to an oscillator. And I don't want to get into that one too much because I think that's, that's pushing the boundaries a little beyond the exam. But the amount of energy in a pendulum is based on how much kinetic energy it has at the bottom and how much potential energy it'll have at its highest point. That's the energy in a pendulum. In a spring mass oscillator, the amount of energy in the oscillator is based on how much potential energy there is in the spring. Now, I'm saying these things because these things tell us how much energy is in the system and their relationship to 
to the amplitude, how the amplitude of these things are measured. But you'll notice there's nothing about amplitude in our equations for period or frequency, which means these things oscillate at the same rate regardless of how far back you pull the pendulum or how far back you pull the mass. The period of oscillation is dependent on physical factors. So because of that, an oscillator should have the same period, whether it's making small oscillations or large oscill oscillations. Which, going back to our, the question that I asked was, how would the period be affected by the way in which you fire the angle? I'm sorry, angle. The way in which you fire the arrow. And the answer would be it wouldn't be. There's no way that the arrow can influence the, the period of oscillation of the pumpkin unless the arrow can somehow change gravity or change the length of the string. If the arrow can't do those two things, then it can't change the period of oscillation of the pumpkin. So it makes for a neat follow-up question. You know, a part, a part, you know, D or something where it says, you know, after your full paragraph length response, you know, how does the arrow affect the period of oscillation of the pumpkin? Be a checkbox there. Doesn't affect it, makes it bigger, makes it smaller. You know, briefly describe why. Well, period is based on the length of the string and nothing else. You know, so some of these things could be explained away that way. And, and our, my experience has been generally that in most of these kinds of problems, the, moment, the simple harmonic motion part tends to be a footnote added to the question as opposed to the entire question on its own. Generally, when it's the entire question, they'll bring in things like vibrations, sound, um, harmonics, uh, waves, and these are all things that were cut from our curriculum for the exam. So I know I don't have to worry about those. So like how musical instruments work. That, that's a really popular kind of discussion on the exam because it has simple harmonic motion in it, but it also has waves in it. And it tends to be, you know, interesting questions related to that. Hold on just one minute. One of the things that if I was going to try and fashion a, a question about simple harmonic motion in, in, in an attempt to try and see if you really understood the topic... What I would probably do is I would probably talk about a hanging system for a number of reasons. Uh, the first being that in a hanging system, we add a level of complication here that purposely, purposely can make this confusing. Um, first, you have to imagine that there's the relaxed state of the spring before you hang the mass on it which is different than the relaxed state of the spring after you hang the mass on it. This is not an oscillating question. This is a Hooke's Law question, stating that the amount, and I'm going to use a big X for this, the amount the spring is stretched when I hang a mass on it is about Hooke's Law. It will stretch more if I put a bigger mass on it. In fact, this position here, this equilibrium position, would be related to um, you know, how heavy the box is. I put a bigger box there, the spring's gonna stretch more. That's Hooke's Law. And that in of itself is no big deal, but if I put a box that's twice as big on the end of the spring, I expect the spring to stretch twice as much. This is just finding equilibrium. In fact, this is the lab we would have done had we come back from spring break. We, I have a bunch of these little springs on, on, on uh, stands and you would have measured the spring constant by putting a mass on there and seeing how far it stretched and putting a bigger mass on there and seeing how far it stretched and so forth, you know, so, so on and so forth until you had a bunch of X's here and, you know, a bunch of M's here, probably vice versa, M here and X's here and the slope of this line would be the spring constant. It's a real simple lab, it takes about five minutes to do and it determines the spring constant of the spring. And then we repeat the lab by taking one of those masses, starting back at the beginning, and lifting up the system a little bit and sending it into oscillations so that the system now 
one's not that one's not as great. The system now is oscillating between two amplitudes. And it has this equilibrium position that it's maintaining in the middle. Something like that. Does that make sense? You can, you can imagine it kind of bouncing up and down. Now, this lab would be different in that we would set it into oscillation and we'd measure the period of oscillation. You can probably imagine a lab here now where I could measure K from the period. A different lab completely. And uh, we would not do this, we're not going to do this lab and we don't have the same kind of lab style questions. I'm setting this up for something else, but I want you to see this is the kind of thing we would do. We put this on the y-axis, this on the x-axis, and you know what I have here in the middle would be the slope of that line, and that's how we'd find the, the spring constant. Now, this is not really what I would expect to see on your exam because the lab style question is, has been kind of neglected in favor of the cohesive paragraph, but this is two different ways of measuring the spring constant. And generally, this is what we do in class to demonstrate, first, that you get the same value for k, no matter which one of these two you do. The idea that k can be measured by Hooke's law just as well as it can be measured by simple harmonic motion makes for an interesting lab. But the most important part is this idea that you have this structure that has oscillations that don't depend on the value for a. So once the kid sets it into motion and watches it bounce, A gets smaller and smaller over time because A represents how much energy was put in the system. And there's air resistance. So air resistance is always taking a little bit of the energy out of the system over time. So the amplitude gets smaller and smaller. So it starts off with big oscillations. And after a while, the oscillations go away. But you're timing them. And you can clearly see in a laboratory setting that the period is the same for little oscillations and big oscillations, which I think is something important if they ask a more involved question about simple harmonic motion, that you really need to indicate that it is detached from how much energy or what the amplitude is. But then I think you need to go on, because this kind of question makes for a challenging discussion topic. Equilibrium is here where that yellow line is. So they might ask you, when does the system have more energy? And in an oscillator, we tended to say that the energy of the system remained constant all the time. Well, this oscillator is a little different because here, the gravitational potential energy and the spring energy are potential. Uh, sorry, there's energy in both the spring and gravitational potential energy. But here... There's no potential energy because that's the lowest point. And here, there's a little bit of potential energy because it's in the middle. So this system is a little, a little more awkward because the energy discussion isn't as clear cut. Now, mathematically, it's, a little, it's more complicated, but it doesn't change anything about the oscillator because the gravitational potential energy is not directly related to the energy in this system. It's still about the spring. But generally in the system, the spring doesn't have to push the weight back down. Gravity can do so. So this kind of spring oscillator has a more complicated energy profile. But I really think that this, the, the challenge of our exam is to see if you understand the physics and the important aspects of physics, not to try and see if they can trick you with details. So this is still an oscillator. We would use this in the lab, and it will perform the exact same way we'd expect the oscillator to because the restoring force still is, is based on the spring. But 
its energy is a little bit more complicated. We wouldn't easily be able to say when does it have the most energy. The energy in the system is constant. That is true. And you can measure that easiest at the lowest point, which if they ask, that's what you should say. Because at the lowest point, it would have no gravitational potential. And all the energy would be in the form of elastic potential. And therefore, this measurement would be the best measurement to make. Finding equilibrium is a little harder because at the equilibrium position, the object still has potential energy, but it's gravitational potential energy. And that equilibrium position is given by Hooke's law. That's where equilibrium is because that's when the net force on the mass would be zero. So, you know, do I see them turning the problem into something like this? No, I don't. But, you know, you were asking about you know, simple harmonic motion. And so this is one of those things where they could see if they could come at you a little sideways. And in order for you to demonstrate what you know, the things about the oscillator that take most precedence, the things that are important to remember is that an oscillator's oscillations are not dependent on its amplitude. They're not dependent on its energy, but are dependent on fixed factors like spring constant and mass, length and gravity. However, it's a dynamic system that comes from there being a force acting on the system to bring the system to equilibrium. And for, for a simple harmonic oscillator, there has to be a Hooke's Law restoring force. In any, any problem where they're adding friction after you've had a system that has been discussed as not having friction, the big picture is always going to be that friction takes energy away. The only time that's not true, let me, let me be more careful. How about that? Because I don't want to say it the way I was about to say it because it, it, it gives you an ultimatum and I don't like that. Friction serves a purpose no matter what. In situations where one surface is sliding, kinetic friction, then friction takes energy away. And so in all cases of kinetic friction, where one surface slides with respect to the other, that friction will be taking energy away. But in cases where that friction causes a torque, then it can also be converting the energy from translational to rotational rolling, which is why static friction doesn't take energy away. Static friction only converts energy from translational to rotational. So when something is rolling, the and I'm using the word very carefully here because rolling is a specific condition where there's no slipping with respect to the surface. So when you are rolling without slipping, then the frictional force that acts on your system is causing a torque. And that torque converts the rotational and the translational energy. So here we'd have, you know, at this point, if it's going to roll down the ramp, there's a frictional force this way. And that frictional force is going to help cause the object to turn. This would have to be static friction if it's rolling without slipping. And this takes the potential energy and converts some of it into rotational kinetic energy, while also allowing the center of mass to move in a straight line this way, where it's going to have some translational kinetic energy. Now, in many cases, when they say that there's no negligible friction, I'm sorry, where they say there's no friction or there's negligible friction, you wouldn't be rolling. In a case where there's negligible friction, the object will slide down the ramp because there's nothing to cause, oops, there's nothing to cause this torque. So in those circumstances, when we talk about those problems,
you know, we'll have a box or something. And so they might make you compare the sliding of the box down the ramp before there was friction with the sliding of the box down the ramp after there was friction. You know, bringing friction into the system, though, in this circumstance, generally is going to cause energy to be taken away from the system. There's going to be work done by friction, which is going to equal the frictional force times the length of the ramp, perhaps something like that. Now, we're not, going to be, we're not going to be using equations on the exam like this, but it reminds us that the farther the object slides, the more work that's going to be done by friction. But what it ultimately will tell us is that if the object started with a certain amount of potential energy at the top of the ramp, there will be less, poten less kinetic energy at the bottom because all of this energy couldn't become kinetic. Some of it got taken away and turned into heat along the ramp. And that was the work done by friction. So the effect of friction in problems like this tends to be to remove energy from the system, which means if you try to slide something up a ramp, it won't go as high. And if you allow something to slide down a ramp, it's not gonna be going as fast. And it's not just these kinds of cases. It means if you shoot a, bull, or shoot a ball into the air, the air resistance is gonna make the ball go slower. It's not gonna go as far. So if it's a projectile, you know, we talked about the projectile problem from the practice test, but if it's a projectile and you have, you know, you're just going to roll something, say, off a table. You know, so here's my table and I'm going to roll something off of it. You know, even though it's rolling on the table and there might be friction here, the moment it's in the air, its ability to travel sideways is impacted by the air resistance. So the moment we have air resistance in the system, its horizontal velocity, Vx, is going to be reduced. It won't be a constant any longer. And because it's going to be coming a smaller and smaller number, we're going to expect that it's going to fall below the path it would have because its velocity is being reduced due to air resistance. So... Whenever they're going to reintroduce friction or air resistance into your problem, generally it's going to take energy away from the system, which ultimately has the result of taking away velocity because it's going to affect the kinetic energy the most.